Kendrick Lamar and my this presentation is about um, computational biology using R and specifically analyzing mitochondrial data using R. So, to, so R is a programming language that is specialized. It's a statistical programming language and it works with big data and because it's very good at working with big data and producing visualizations of big data. Um, it has a unique application in bioinformatics. So today we'll be going over installing R in our studio, which is like the graphical, the ed graphical editor for R, the basics of the R programming language, M Toolbox, which is a genetic toolkit for R, and basic concepts in genetics, and reading data and plotting graphs in R and analyzing mitochondrial genomic data in R. So I would encourage you all to minute, like, um, make sure that, make your Zoom not full screen so that you can see your computer screen and your, and the Zoom in the corner. So like, make sure the Zoom screen is not full screen because we should be, we'll be working with, um, you'll be working on your computers as well. So, um, first we're going to download R, so I'm going to share the link for the download in the chat. So, everyone should be able to see um, the link to download R. So, I'm going to click on, one sec. Um, I'm going to, I've clicked on the link and to download R for Windows, we're going to go here and then click install R for the first time. If you're on a Mac, go here and then press, press here. And if you're on a mobile device or if you cannot get it to work, then feel free to just follow along. You don't have to do any of the activities. So I'm going to download R for Windows, and then just please free, feel free to follow along if you are able to on your own computer. So we're going to download R for Windows. And then open when done. And then for convenience, um, remove program files from the destination location. Make sure there's only one slash. And then yes. Next. Next. Um, so I've already installed R, so I'm gonna I'm just showing you guys to like show you guys how to download it. So I'm gonna unclick these two, but if you have not downloaded R yet, then please have these two checked if you're following along.
So um, I actually have to close where I'm currently doing. So I'm going to try that again. And then now R is downloading. Okay, so now we've downloaded R, then the next thing is to download is R Studio, which is the graphical editor for R. So if you're following along, then um, I will be posting in the chat soon, one sec. Yeah, so I've posted the link to download it in the chat. So if you're following along, then click on, um, yeah, click on the link. And then if you're on Windows, then click here. And if you're on a Mac, then click over here. Okay, so this is a setup guide. So next, I'm going to remove program files for convenience and then next, install. So now it's installing.
Um, so um, could someone type in the chat what exactly is not working, if it's not working? Okay, so um, if yeah, you just have to download it, yeah. Okay, so I'll wait two minutes for people to download it and then we'll start on our studio. So that's the one I typed in the chat is to download the, the link for the graphical editor, but then, yeah. So I'll wait a few minutes. Hi, Siddharth. Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, your chat is going to panelists. I need you to adjust to go to all panelists and attendees because no one can see your chat. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, so. Yeah, so um, the link download, go to the link that I put in the chat right now and then um, please try downloading it. So if, um, is everyone, has everyone downloaded it or is in the process of downloading? Um, type in the chat if you are not, we're not, are not able to download it. Okay, so um, we'll begin. Okay, so um, one of the one key concept, basic concept in R are variables, and I'm going to open up R Studio. and create a new one, new file, new file, our script. Okay, so, um, so basically in other, in other programming languages, you might've heard of like Java or Python. When you assign variables, they use an equal to sign but then in R, it's done using an, like an arrow. So that would be 
the greater than sign, which shift and then comma, and then a hyphen. So if we want to assign the value of two to the variable X, we would just do X and then the arrow and then two, and then go to the beginning of the line and then run. So now the number two is assigned to the variable X. And then, um, so then there are different classes of variables like numeric, character, character being, it would be like a string of letters. And then if we want to find the class of variable that X is, we would do class X and then go to the beginning of the line and run it. And then it's of class numeric. And then if we wanted to make X a a string instead or a character we could do X and then do the arrows and then EE -E, and then we can go to the beginning of the line and then run then now that now if we do class X and run then now as you can see class X says character and through this, we can, so variables are, like in all programming languages, variables are an important component of R. So does anyone have any questions? Okay, so I'll move on. So, So yeah, that's the link to download it. And then if you're on Windows, then go to the start in the top, in the bottom left and the start in the bottom left and then type in R Studio, then you should be able to open it. Okay, so now we'll go on to what a, a vector is in R. So the function C with parentheses creates a vector in R. So a vector is similar to an array in other programming languages, like in, like in Java and Python use arrays, but in R they use vectors. So if we want to make uh, X a vector, we would do X is C1, comma, 2, comma, 3, comma, 4, comma, 5. If you go to the beginning of the line and run that, then now X is assigned to all the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then if we do class X and then go to the beginning of the line and run it, it's numeric since all of the number, all of the parts of the vector, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, were numeric. Okay, so we can also do the same thing using x is c and then 1 colon 5 and then go to the beginning of the line and run and then just type in x and go to the beginning of the line and run it. So even when we do 1 colon 5, r knows to do a, the sequence of numbers ascending from one to five. So that's how we could create vectors in R. Vectors can also be characters as well. We could we could put strings in the a vector could be a collection of strings. It doesn't necessarily have to be a collection of numeric variables. So now I'm going to go on to data frames in R. So data frames are an important way to store information in R and especially for big data like biological data. It stores data in a table format and R has a lot of commands that could help us easily manipulate data tables. So I'm going to create a small 
a small data table. So I'm gonna just and then I'm just gonna um, create a small data table. So A tab B and then one tab two, three, tab four. And I'm gonna save this as um, data, data. And then, yes, yeah, so this is just a, that was just a really small data table. And if you can, if you're on, if you're following along, there's a session bar in the top and then set working directory and then choose directory. This will, you have to put all the, um, the file should be in the same directory that you choose here. So since data is in downloads, I'm just gonna open it there. And then now I'm going to copy the line of code here into here. So if you can see then, um, the table is reading data from do the command read.dlm and what read.dlm does is it separates it separates by tab so like it creates the columns and rows based on where you've done the tab you can also do read.csv if the data is separated by commas instead so i'm going to go to the beginning of the line and run it so Let's go to, um, so let's view. The view is a command to help us effectively visualize the data table. So as you can see, we created a small data table with the two, the headers as we um, put in our data, um, A and B, and then the data itself, one, two, three, and four. And then that's how we create a basic data table in R. Okay, so, so header equals true. Since we, as you can, we said header equals true inside the inside our command and that made sure that the A and B were headers and not actually data. So now I'm going to go on to something called M toolbox. So genetic sequencing data is essentially data that encapsulates the genetic information that's present within an organism and it consists of both the chromosomal DNA data the mitochondrial DNA data. So um, the chromosomes in the nucleus are not the only things that have DNA data. The my mitochondria also have DNA data. And mToolbox is an automated program that extracts mitochondrial DNA data from DNA sequencing data. And it formats the mitochondrial DNA data into a table format. So in this workshop, we will be analyzing mitochondrial DNA data. So the data files that we are using in this workshop have been generated um, from genome data, have been automatic, the mitochondrial DNA data has been automatically extracted. So like I said before, genetic material is present in the mitochondria as well. And as you probably know from a biology class, there are four nucleotides, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And what big DNA data files do is encapsulate millions of nucleotides into the file. And this is like to represent the genetic sequence of an organism. And an allele is the variant, like it's a, it's a sequence that represents a certain gene. And a variant allele, is a mutation of the allele. So for example, um, if at a specific location, um, there's in most of the human population, there's an A, 
but then in one person they have a mutation and then they have a C, like a cytosine, then that's they have a variant allele and these variant alleles are caused by mutations. And oftentimes genetic diseases are caused by these variant alleles since they deviate from what normal human, the normal human population have and this could lead to a defective gene and which would lead to a disease. So does anyone have any questions? There are currently no questions in the Q&A. Okay, so yeah, I will share the link of the drive here. Um, I'll sharing it soon. So yeah, the link to the drive is in the chat. Okay, so um, mitochondrial DNA is passed from the mothers only from the mothers only, unlike the DNA of the nucleus, which is passed from both parents. And the mitochondria, as you probably know, is responsible for generating ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. Okay, so um, I put the link for the drive in the chat. So if you're following along, then please um, open it up on, the, on your computer. And then go down to 1DA, which would be the last one. And then we'll go to File, um, Download, and then dot csv it says comma separated values dot csv so click on that and then open the file So can everyone see the spreadsheet? Okay, so then we would have to save it in the proper location so that R can use it. So we would go to file, save as, um, browse, and download since the session that we um, set R to was in downloads. And then we would go to, so then in order to read this file, um, we would need to use like a command to read data into R. So I've posted, um, the posted the code that you need to copy into R into the chat. So um, please copy that if you're following along and then try to make it into one line in R. So then I'm going to go to the beginning of this line and then run it so the data set has been loaded and then we can type in view data set and then the beginning of the line and run. So here is how the data, the data has now been input into R. And if you got an error message with the reading into the CSV, then um, your file might not have been in the download section. 
uh, if you're a directory, so make sure you did that if you're following along. And then basically some things that are included are the sample, which is one DA, the variant allele, which this is the position on the mitochondria that the mutation is at. And then the C here is what the mutated allele is. So the files here that mTOLBAX extracts only include variant alleles. So then this is the gene that the variant is present in. So yeah, we have, you have the Google access to the Google slides since um, I posted the link to the Google Drive above. Yeah, I'll go up to the code soon. And there's mutation prediction algorithms for the certain variant allele. Okay, so yeah, so here's the code I've already done. And then if we type in head data set and then go to the beginning of the line and run it, we in the console on the bottom, we can see the first six lines. It's all split up because there's many columns and it can't fit on one like one line and then, so now um, the data set is loaded into R and then, so R is, we'll go on to plotting data in R. So R is useful, R is very useful in plotting data because in just one line, you can create a plot based on um, variables within the table. So in order to plot, um, we're going to do, so we're going to plot something within R and then I'm going to type, I'm going to paste the code you need to type into R within the chat. And then, um, I'm going to put it in R as well. And then I'm going to copy both lines and run. So here's the plot that R outputted based on the code that I put in. So what this plot shows is essentially so you can see that the high pathogenicity and low pathogenicity are on the x-axis and variability is on the y-axis. So high pathogenicity um, refers to the likelihood that the variant allele causes a disease and low pathogenicity refers to the likely, like low pathogenicity shows that the, it's less likely to cause disease, the variant's less likely to cause disease, well, High pathogenicity so that the variant is more likely to cause disease. So as you can see, for a low pathogenicity, um, there's a lot higher variability, nucleotide variability, than in high pathogenicity. And this is because essentially the nucleotide variability factor that M toolbox shows is show is about the nucleotide variability of the normal allele. So if there's a mutation and that mutation is likely to cause disease, then that won't pass down to the next generation because that they might die and not pass on their genes. And for that reason, the nucleotide variability of the normal allele will be less because when the when it's more likely to cause more likely to cause disease, when the mutation is more likely to cause disease, then the variability will be less in the norm for the normal allele. But when the mutation is less likely to cause disease, then that variant can still get passed down to the offspring and the variability will be higher for the for that allele. So when it's less likely to cause disease, then there'll be a higher variability at 
for those low pathogenicity variants. So through R, we can identify these trends very quickly. And this is, we can effectively identify trends from big data sets in R very efficiently. So yeah, here's the plot that we received. So then, and as you noticed, you might have noticed the plot that we got was pretty rudimentary. It didn't look as professional. So when people want to want to create professional plots for like a scientific paper, for instance, they'll use something called ggplot, which is a which gives more professional graphs, as you can see. So um, I'll copy the code needed to run that in the chat. So yeah, start. So if you're following along, then copy starting from install packages down to the T apply, and then I'm going to copy that into R, and then you would have to highlight all of the lines and then run. But since I've already installed ggplot2, which is, then I'm going to remove that and just run these. And as you can see, um, we produced a more professional looking graph that shows the same things that the previous graph showed, but is, is like it for publishing, if you want to publish a scientific paper, then you would have to use ggplot within R. And then in the console, if you, um, I put a command called t apply, which essentially shows the mean nucleotide variability for the high plasticity and low plasticity. So the mean nucleotide variability for high plasticity was 0.0009. And for low plasticity, it was 0.0559. So this we can find the mean of these two very easily. So then let's go on to the next plot we're going to create. So I'm going to so basically, different genes would have a different likelihood of causing a disease since, since some genes are more important than other genes, a, a mutation in that specific gene would be more impactful to um, the survival, would be more detrimental to the survival than a mutation in another gene. So if we want to find that in R, we, we, would, we, would, like, we would want to find that in R if we're working with biological data. So in the chat, I'm going to I'm going to um, post what you need for this next plot. So start with the data set dollar sign and go down to the plot. So essentially what the dollar sign does is it selects the column that we have to, we can use since data set was the table and the nucleotide variability was, was the column. So if you want to select the column, then we would use a dollar sign. So as you can see, when we plotted the gene or locus and then this panther dot right over here is like there's three categories: no info, neutral, and disease, which means like the likelihood that a certain mutation within that gene would cause a disease. Then we get a plot corresponding like this. So if we we can see that in especially MTND5 their disease is in light gray. So there's a lot of mutations. If there's a mutation in the gene NTND5, then it's more likely to cause disease than for instance in MTATP6 when where a mutation is 
less likely to cause disease since there's so many, the majority of mutations in MTND5 are likely to cause disease, while that is not the case for genes like MTHD6. And we can identify the genes that are more critical and where mutations are more detrimental very efficiently using R, and that's why R is a very popular tool for bioinformatics. So what MTND5 is, it's a subunit of NADH dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme that transfers electrons from one protein to another protein, and it's involved in the, in the creation of ATP. So um, now I'll move on to variant filtering. So in, in bio, when you have large biological data, oftentimes we would want to select based on a certain condition. So like we would not only want to select the genes that only, only want to select the variants that have a high likelihood to cause disease, or maybe we only want to select the variants that are in a specific gene. And we could do this like for further convenience since it would minimize the data set and allow us to manipulate it more effectively. So R get, has a lot of tools to um, effectively reduce, effectively filter for certain variants. So um, I'll paste the code needed into the chat. So what this does is um, it's we're creating a new data set that selects for the only only the ones that are probably damaging or likely to cause disease for further manipulation. And then if we go into R and then put that right below and then run. Then we could type in view with a capital V, view data set new, which is the new data set that we created. And then we could run that. And then as you can see, it's much smaller than before. And then the only variants that are included are the ones that say probably damaging here. Yeah, so this would allow us to effectively manipulate these variants more. And then you could also notice the table commands I did here. And then this essentially gives me the number, the count of how many of the variants come from each gene, like MTHP6, MTND5, as you can could see from the from the previous graph. And when we increase the console and look um, at data set new. This data set new only has the alleles that are probably damaging. So as you can see, MTND5 has 25 variants and then MTND4 has 18, so the vast majority of So if you're getting um, the error message object data set was not found, then um, you didn't run the previous line where we um, um, this line over here where we read the data from yeah where we read the data from um, the file. So if you scroll further in the chat, then you could see that line and then copy it. And then yeah, this file was in the drive and make sure that it was, it's put in downloads. And then if we just did a table for the whole data set, not just the ones that are probably damaging, as you can see here, um, then a lot of the variants come from MTND5 and MTND4, like the previous one, but a lot of them also come from MTD loop. But then in this one, um, zero came from MTD loop. 
So there's a lot of variants in MTD loop, but none of them are damaging. And this is because MTD loop is a hypervariable region of the mitochondrial genome that does not, where there are a lot of different variants, but they do not contribute to disease since they vary so much from person to person. And through R, we can identify what kind of regions in the genome could be hypervariable, which, um, yeah, makes it a makes it very effective. And so let's move on to variant filtering continued. Um, so as you, as we covered before, um, um, the mitochondrial genes come from the mom. So if we find variants in the child that are not present in the mom, then we, we should be able to take a further look at these variants since they're in the child but not the mom. So we could filter for those variants using the command that I will put into the chat. And essentially what this does is we're creating a new data set called data set unique that does not include all the variants that includes all the variants that are not in the mom, in the mom, but are in the child. And we are further filtering that by selecting all of those variants that are the child but not the mom and are probably damaging as well. So um, we would have to, as you, we would have to read the data from the mom. So um, that's in one MO. So yeah, it's in one MO. Then file, download as CSV. And then we could open that and save it in downloads. Yeah, so now we've, um, so now we've um, downloaded the file from the mother and then we can put that in the chat and then copy all, you can put that in R and then you can copy all the lines and run. Okay, so so um, if we type in view data set four and then go to the beginning of the line and run it. Um, yeah, so these are all the variants that are unique in the child but not in the mom. And these are not present in all the mitochondria, but in some of them. And um, these, all of them have, all of them in here say probably, wait one sec. Yeah, so now all of them say probably damaging. And so we filtered all, all, of, the, all of the variants that are in the child, but not in the mom and are probably damaging. So we could easily do further analyses on this, which makes, which makes R powerful in that we can effectively 
filter variants. And then we had a table command where we, it just gives us a summary of how many are the frequency of each. And then we can see that most of these variants are in MTND5 and in MTND4. And these are the ones that are probably damaging. And this, in our graph, as we can see, though we noticed that MTND5 had a lot of variants that caused disease, and that corresponds to this table as well, since a lot of the variants with MTND5 are probably damaging. Yeah, so yeah, in summary, R was useful in filtering variants from larger data sets. So now I'll go to go on to PCA. I'm not sure how much this will cover, but we can get an introduction to it. So um, the intro and keynote speaker had shown some graphs of their PCA plots with, with genetic data from people around Europe in like a PCA plot. So I'll explain a little of what that is. So PCA stands for principal component analysis. So when we have multiple independent variables that define a dependent variable, it would be difficult to plot the relationships of all of the independent variables to dependent variables since if we have like five independent variables, then it's impossible to plot a graph with five axes since, yeah, that's just not possible. So what PCA does is it reduces the multiple independent variables into two independent variables so that we could easily graph, so we could easily graph it and analysis and visualization becomes easier. So let's, so let's understand what that means a little bit more. So example, if we have a table with the list of basketball players and number of points, assists, re rebounds, blocks, and steals that they average. So that means we have five dimensions or five independent variables. And then if we want to identify variation within the data or like patterns of clustering, meaning where the same players in the same position would be in the same parts of the graph. We, would, we couldn't do this on a five axis graph since that's not possible. So since there's no way to plot five dimensional data, we would have to reduce the graph to two dimensions so that we could um, view it easily. And PCA is a technique in R that helps us view this easily. So um, here is the code that we need to run PCA. Um, you could, since I, you guys have the link to the, um, link to the PowerPoint and things, you can do this after the this session as well. So So then there's a lot of code, but then I'll explain, I'll show you guys a shortcut that works pretty, but that one line shortcut that can do the same functions. So let's, I'm gonna copy all of that into R and then and then run, and then, so we got two plots. Um, so here's one of the plots that we received, and here is one of the other plots that we received, and which corresponds 
which is the same plots that we had here. So these plots look similar to what um, the intro and keynote speaker had um, shown you guys. So essentially there are five independent variables that we had, but then if we wanted to graph variation using all five variables, we wouldn't be able to do that because we couldn't plot a graph on five dimensions. So this plot is on two dimensions and uses there and then PC1 and PC2 here use weighted averages of all of the variables here to create these independent these axes. And then as you can see from the graph on the left, there's a lot of orange points that to the right. And then the arrows here um, in the the right the graph to the right show that nucleotide variability and amino acid variability are go to the right. So benign um, mutations, benign, when the mutation is benign, then the nucleotide variability is increased. And I explained the biological phenomenon for this previously. And then um, you, can, you can see the, a lot of the purple dots are close to the top left. And that corresponds to the, this arrow, which um, which is fast const 20 way and phylogen. They're very close together. And these are measures of evolutionary conservation. So when there's a mutation that is benign, then that can get passed down from the parents to the offspring. And then the normal allele is not as evolutionarily conserved. But when the mutation causes a disease, then it won't get passed down to the parents to the offspring. So the normal allele is more conserved and is present in a larger proportion of the population. So um, the evolutionary conservation will increase when the mutation is more likely to cause a disease. And here's a one line shortcut that um, does the same things as the plot above. And Yes, yeah, so now we get the plot. So what I did to make it work was I had to um, show a library called GG Fortify, installed um, first. I had to do install that packages um, GG Fortify. Yeah. So yeah, we're done, and then the library so we're done um thank you all for listening and um we'll move on to the next workshop thank you so much siddharth